With more than 6,000 small and micro cap companies listed, if you're looking for the next Apple at the earliest stage, then Channel Check truly is the orchard. The listed companies support Channel Check, so it's free for you, the potential investor, to gain access to institutional quality research from FINRA licensed analysts, advanced market data, industry reports, news, and a growing catalog of videos and webcasts. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and register for Channel Check so you're always up to date on what's going on at the small and microcap data place. Welcome to the virtual roadshow series presented by Channel Check. This roadshow features Justin Dye, CEO, and Nancy Huber, CFO of Schwaz, OTC ticker symbol SHWZ. Following a formal presentation, they are joined by Joe Gomes, Senior Research Analyst for Noble Capital Markets, a FINRA-licensed SEC-registered broker-dealer, for a Q&A session featuring questions that were submitted by the live audience. You can find Noble's research on Schwaz on channelcheck.com or by clicking the link in the description. With that, I am pleased to present Justin and Nancy. Great. Thank you, Chris. Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the Schwaz uh, Non-Deal Roadshow here. Glad to be here with you. Uh, with me, I have Nancy Huber, our CFO, and I'm Hi. Justin, Chairman and CEO of the business. Uh, next slide, we'll take you through our safe harbor uh, statement here, and then we'll get to our presentation. Our vision is to build a really great uh, company that's built uh, based upon tastes and needs and wants of our customers and continue to uh, connect with them around services and products, uh, both for medical as well as recreational. We have uh, we've built a company that's built on good fundamentals. So with process and technology and channels to market and uh, our customers uh, are rewarding us with, uh, with shopping us frequently and we're gonna continue to really be focused on the customer. And we believe we're positioned for accelerated growth as we have built this business to scale uh, with the right people, the right processes, and the right technology. And right now we have great operating momentum. Uh, capital markets are uh, cooperating. We're going to see lower cost of capital in the future. And we have a tremendous growth pipeline of acquisitions as well as new stores and new product growth ahead of us. So as, the, as building the premier Colorado cannabis company uh, that's vertically integrated, when you look at it, our, uh, we're, we're a growing powerhouse. Uh, we generate free cash flow as demonstrated in our first quarter of $1.7 million. If you look at the top end of our range, uh, we're guiding towards 125, which would represent a 421% year over year increase. And Colorado is the beginning. We're going to stay focused on Colorado, but certainly we think that our operating system will translate to other markets in other states. And we'll be very diligent and be very thoughtful about how we enter the next set of states. We've architected a, uh, a, really, a really solid growth pipeline from our acquisition team to our due diligence team to our ability to execute transactions. And, and get the legal documentation done as well as applying uh, with the MED and then being able to integrate those companies and realize the value of the combined company. So we'll show uh, some of those case studies here in, in a moment. So we, uh, we've built a really great team. We're building a great house of brands, uh, products that we will develop ourselves as well as partnering with the leading brands in the sector uh, that are putting a lot of uh, money and research and innovation in terms of products, and we'll we'll offer both. Our team is uh, it's a very good team. I'm very excited about this team. It's one that uh, works well together. We have deep expertise operationally with Narup Krishnamurthy, our chief operating officer. Dan Pabone has a, a wealth of knowledge around cannabis and was one of the initial authors of the cannabis regulations in Colorado when he was in the House of Representatives in the state. Julie Suntrup brings a, a great background in building great products, CBG products and brands, and comes from Anheuser-Busch. Uh, Nancy has brought great uh, discipline around budgeting and our finance and accounting and being able to anticipate uh, our markets, being able to raise capital, et cetera. Jim Parco brings a great experience 
in research and manufacturing. Uh, we, uh, we just recently launched Quaz Bio, uh, Biosciences, and Jim will, uh, will be the president of that business. Todd Williams and Colin Lodge have spent time in M&A and have spent time in other sectors and are doing a great job of running retail as well as uh, leading our M&A efforts. We have, a, we have a very effective board as well. Pratap Mukherjee is, uh, comes from Bain Consulting where he ran their supply chain practice and brings a lot to us from a strategy perspective. Uh, Jeff Garwood brings uh, years of experience in running large uh, industrial companies focused on manufacturing and distillation. Uh, Salim Wadan is an entrepreneur from Starbuds and brings, brings a, a great perspective, voice of the customer for things that we're developing and building. Brian Rudin, a highly successful entrepreneur, helped build Starbuds into what it is today. And we're lucky to have him on the board. And then Jeff Kozad uh, is, a, is, a, is an investor who just recently joined the board of directors and brings uh, capital markets experience, uh, investor experience, and uh, brings a lot to the table. So we're excited about having Jeff on the board as well. So by the numbers, if you look at, uh, if you look at the company, we still were founded in 2014. We have, uh, we have converted what was a consulting and a ancillary business into the leading vertically integrated business in Colorado today. Uh, Die Capital invested in 2019 to capitalize the company, to build out the systems, build out processes, hire the team, and to do acquisitions. We acquired Purple Bees and Mesa Organics in April of 2020. We concluded our Starbuds acquisition in March of 2021 this year, and we're positioned for, for future growth. We have 17 dispensaries all within the state of Colorado today, and we have one cultivation site that we will be, be growing and, and adding more to. And then we also have a manufacturing campus uh, in Pueblo that produces our distillate and products. Next slide. So a quick investor snapshot um, using the share price that closed on Friday, we have um, 42.3 million uh, common shares outstanding and 87.2 thousand preferred shares. When you convert those along with our warrants and stock options that are in the money and vested, we have uh, fully diluted about 120 million shares. That gives us a market cap of 291 and an enterprise value of uh, 322.8 million. As Justin said, we had positive operating cash flow. The adjusted EBITDA for Q1 was 5.8 million and free cash flow was 1.1. Um, and we ended the quarter with $23 million in the bank. Um, when you look at our stock price and our market cap, we're trading at about 2.7. Um, times the reven average revenue range. So our in the middle of our range is 117 million. We're trading at about 2.7 times that. And EBITDA, the middle of the range is 33 million for the year, about 9.7 times that. We believe we are significantly uh, lower in terms of trading value compared to our uh, comparatives. And we believe that's a opportunity for investors. Um, Joe is one of our analysts that's following us, and um, you can see the timeline of the company's move into plant touching uh, with Mesa Organics purchased in April of last year. We finished the Starbuds acquisition in March of this year, and we launched a bioscience division in May of this year to do some R&D work, both in products and in uh, the efficacies of uh, THC. A uh, quick financial review of uh, what we forecasted for the year. So we have given guidance from 110 to 125 million in terms of revenue for the year and adjusted EBITDA of 30 to $36 million this year for EBITDA. Um, and then there's a quick little slide down here that says, you know, we have given guidance that we'd like to double the revenue from the 125 million to 250 million through acquisitions this year. So that is our target in terms of acquisition revenue. And you can see a little bit down here, you, the, the original company had just around $12 million in base revenue uh, in 19. 
This is the pro forma revenue, which was 95 million for the two companies that we acquired, uh, Purple Bees and Starbuds. And then again, the guidance between 110 and 125. And as we said, our target is to acquire, um, to have revenues in 250. In terms of performance for the year or for the quarter, excuse me, uh, we were we had revenue up 504% from last year. Again, we didn't have any plant touching businesses in Q1 of last year, so 3.2 million versus 19.3 million this year. Significant contribution from retail, obviously. Wholesale also grew. Those segments include our purple bees. Uh, wholesale business, as well as the two um, non-cannabis businesses we have, Success Nutrients and Big Tomato, and then most of the other area is consulting revenue. Pogs were 9.9 .9 million, that's adjusted for a $2.2 million purchase accounting, so we reported uh, the 12.1 million, but when you adjust just for the retail purchase accounting, we were at 9.9, .9 with gross profit at 48.9%, and adjusted EBITDA at 30% of revenue. Uh, retail stats also were very impressive. So retail sales for um, Starbuds, because we did not have Mesa prior year information, retail sales were up 38%. That's 13% over the Colorado market growth for the same quarter. So outperformed the market by almost uh, 50%. Customer visits were up 15.8% over last year and basket sizes were up 19.5% over last year. Yeah, the next, the next slide, the next slide really speaks to our cornerstone retail acquisition of the various Starbucks assets. So in December of 2020, we closed six of the 13 Starbud uh, entities and through February, March, we closed on the remaining seven uh, making up a total of 13 that we've added to our four Mace Organic stores, which uh, we have now rebannered those Mace Organic stores to Starbucks. So Starbucks is our brand and our banner in Colorado today. Total consideration, we paid about four times EBITDA of 118.6 million, 44.9 uh, in cash, $44 million of a seller note, five-year seller note, and then 29.5 in preferred stock uh, so we have great alignment with our team and we expect to continue to see strong results from that business. It's a great business focused on the customer. And we think by adding adding them to our, our Schwaz platform and sharing best practices that we're going to continue to grow and continue to create value there. Next slide. So this really speaks to our ability to create value with uh, with scaling these businesses and adding, you know, adding capabilities to what are already great businesses. So as you can see in Purple Bees, we've uh, we tripled the manufacturing output of distillates. So from 76 kilograms when we bought the business to 225 kilograms in April, and we're seeing that continue to scale. Uh, the team has done a very nice job of scaling that business, both on the commercial side as well as operationally, and the team's focused on driving lean manufacturing processes to continue to take our quality standards up and continue to become more and more productive uh, as we take market share in Colorado. The next slide is Mace Organics. And not only have we grown that business substantially since we bought it, but the margin impact of running our operating system is working very well. So looking at the four P's of merchandising, so product, placement, pricing, promotions, and uh, looking at our assortment in the stores to give the customers a uh, a great assortment with lots of choices and different value uh, parameters. So the team has done a nice job of taking those margins up nearly 1,400 basis points since we took over. And then lastly, Starbuds. So uh, closing the final Starbuds in early March, we could already start to see some of the scale synergies that we have through buying together, um, et cetera, taking gross margins from 53% up to 57%. And this is all about alignment, knowing what we want to try to go accomplish, putting the right tracking methods in place, and you know, making sure we're all on the same page and running the same playbook. And we're and where we're headed. So we want to be building a, a house of distinguished brands that are consciously sourced from great partners that uh, put a lot of care in their product, their high quality products, 
and they've got great teams supporting that along with great craftsmanship, great packaging and building, you know, building product loyalty and building brand loyalty uh, one customer at a time. And under, you know, really underpinning that is our commitment to, to running great operations and building this on fundamentals, making sure that we stay in touch with our customers on their wants, needs and where they're going and what their uh, emerging requirements are. Being very data driven, we've implemented our ERP system. We have a data lake. We're able to look at promotional effectiveness. We're able to look at product profitability. We're able to look at our customers habits and spend a lot of time making sure that we're stepping up to their needs. And all of this happens with a team that uh, that gets along well, uh, who likes working together and has a lot of energy. And we uh, we have that in this team and uh, we're excited about the future. And then, you know, obviously making sure uh, we're diverse with our with our thinking and with uh, engaging uh, different vendors, our customers, et cetera. We think that enriches the company and we certainly want to be good stewards of the communities that we where we do business and support those community efforts, whether it be working with minority owned businesses, whether it be making a difference from a charity perspective, giving folks an opportunity for uh, a job in the in these places and making sure we're putting them on a good career path. But uh, our team is uh, very excited about creating a really great company that's diverse. So vertical integration, we've talked about that. We're gonna, so 17 dispensaries, one manufacturing campus, where we uh, develop where we develop our own products as well as manufacture distillate. And then we have one small cult indoor cultivation that we will be adding to here in, um, in the future. And then we've launched our <clears throat> R&D business that is going to be a, a rapid sort of application of doing research on cannabinoids and uh, different forms of different forms of THC and being able to quickly learn, develop, develop SOPs around that to apply that to new products. We think that's very important as we think about our product development and being able to convert research into uh, meaningful products quickly. And uh, we're excited to have Jim Parco run that business for us. So our emerging house of brands, you can see that uh, today we have Starbuds and Purple Bees at a retail level. If you look at Medicine Man, our consulting business, Success Nutrients, uh, as well as our Three Alight and Big Tomato, those are all B2B businesses where we support growers and folks in the cannabis industry. You'll see us continue to develop our retail brands uh, for products in the different categories and flower as we go forward. And we really wanna stand for quality and making sure we're putting outstanding products with great brand loyalty uh, on our shelves and, and on our omni-channel assets. So brands uh, brands offered, I think this is an important thing to, to talk about here. So we are, <clears throat> we're certainly gonna have our own house brands and brands that we carry within our stores, but we're also partnering with the leading, leading CPG MIPS uh, in our state to make sure we're offering what the customers want. And we think, from an assortment perspective, that's very important versus just offering our own brands. Certainly the own brands can certainly bring a better margin, but we, we don't wanna be all things to all people. So meaning we will be very select, uh, selective around what products and brands we develop in house and we'll part, continue to partner uh, with great manufacturers and suppliers of, of product and flour in the state to really target the different cohorts. Omnichannel is going to continue to be a bigger part of our business. Uh, we think internally this could be anywhere from 30 to 40 percent of our business, whether it's uh, whether it be curbside, whether it be shopping within our brick and mortar store, same day delivery, next day delivery. We're building those capabilities and we're going to also continue to tinker, test and measure you know, new experiences uh, at retail and through our omnichannel options. So, uh, we're excited about continuing to uh, meet the customer where they want to be met based upon the shopping occasion that they're uh, uh, they're in at that point in time. And we think Omnichannel added to our brick and mortar uh, business will be very, very powerful. And we're going to be kicking that off here early summer uh, in a in Aurora in Denver, Colorado, or a suburb of Denver. So the stigma, I think, is in the rear view mirror is really what this slide's talking about. Uh, cannabis is mainstream today. It continues to develop 
uh, great momentum across the country, uh, driven by the needs of customers, both on the medical side and on the rec side. And you know, it's uh, it's great investors who've built large businesses, uh, as well as uh, as well as celebrities and folks that are no longer afraid to associate or have their name associated with with cannabis. We have great belief in in the power of the plant and its ability to uh, to treat people's different needs, and uh, you can see that here. So from an outlook perspective, let's just if you look at a total addressable market across the United States. Uh, we believe cannabis is going to be a very large business. This, depending on which uh, you know which report you look at, this shows 75 billion dollars by 2030. Uh, outsizing organic food sales, wine sales. This is a big total addressable market. Uh, we're starting in Colorado, which is the second largest state at 2.4 billion dollars, growing at 26 percent. And our goal is to go very deep in Colorado, and then we'll take our operating system to the next opportunity. When you look at when you look at the opportunity, and you can see how Colorado ranks here. So 2021 estimated sales of 2.5 billion. You can see across the country on the left hand side, uh, recreational is green, medical is blue. Uh, the chart is continued to be colored in as we go with uh, new states such as New Jersey and New York and South Dakota uh, coming online and we'll continue to see this. So we're positioned well for, uh, for Colorado and continue to grow in Colorado. We think we're uniquely positioned uh, to have other states under our belt as well where we can develop a number one position. So our growth is both on, gonna be on the vertical integration side as we, as we continue to look at products and manufacturing and cultivation capabilities uh, from a vertical integration standpoint, but also from an expansion, geographic expansion standpoint at retail. If you look here, the gold, the gold uh, uh, nuggets here are show where we are, where we're stationed today. So we have good presence in Denver Metro and in the southeast part of the state, we have growth opportunities to the west, to the north, uh, to the southwest, as well as the northeast, that we think there's a lot of opportunity to continue to grow with new stores, with acquisitions. And uh, you can see that from a fragmentation standpoint, big market, but when you look at the 603 retail dispensaries, 468 are controlled by small, smaller operators who are good operators in their right, but we think that the market will continue to consolidate and we, we hope to be a participant in that and being a good steward of these businesses that we're acquiring and, and continue to help make them better and to get synergies uh, for our investors. So our growth playbook, we have spent really the last year and a half of putting together, how do we want to build the business, building it to last, building it for scale on the retail side, looking for new stores and new geographies and continue to do acquisitions there, continue to improve operations at retail all the way through to our supply chain. Launching e-commerce will be a great growth opportunity for us to continue to expand uh, the industry and continue to expand our top line. On the wholesale side, we call on some of the very, very best MIPS uh, in the state and we sell them distillate. And uh, our goal is to continue to drive efficiency in that business and provide really high quality distillate uh, with with great supply chain operations that we deliver on time, uh, on time, on budget, and uh, are, we're great partners with those manufacturers, and it's worked it's worked very well so far. We're going to continue to increase our capacity uh, in our Purple Bees manufacturing facilities, and then lastly, uh, new opportunities in new states and looking at new channels to market as well as new offerings. So those are sort of in the upper right hand quadrant of of new opportunities that we'll continue to, to work on as we see opportunities in other states. Okay. So we're building to building a house of distinguished brands is sort of the is where we're headed. And that's both retail banners, so the names uh, outside the dispensary online, as well as those products that we carry and that we sell to others. So it starts with a retail first model. We believe in having retail and being able to have that shelf space and really drive a great experience being in stock with great bud tenders, with great service, uh, with great brands and great products. It starts with that and being 
you know, being very good at retail. And then growing into uh, continue to drive our supply chain efficiencies, whether it be cultivation, whether it be, whether it be transportation and buying, as well as manufacturing. And then we have, we've, we've dedicated a lot of our resources to building a really good uh, growth blueprint. So from M&A target identification to going out and reaching out to those targets, to doing due diligence, getting them financed, closing those deals, and then integrating them into our integrated platform. And we're entering a stage where we think there's an opportunity to create a lot of value for all of our shareholders. Uh, and our stakeholders for that matter. And we believe capital is getting easier to raise and we believe our cost of capital is gonna continue to come down and we've got great regulatory tailwinds. And we expect to see uh, something around safe banking, which of course would allow us to have a, a much broader set of financial institutions that we can work with uh, for account services, for treasury services, for banking, and perhaps even loans and being able to maybe have credit card, uh, a credit card business as well that we think would grow the category. And then building to having a, a tremendous set of brands that we're very proud of that uh, customers are connected to, uh, whether it be at retail level or whether it be, you know, products and flour. So the investment, the opportunity, uh, hyper growth market, large total addressable market, we, we believe we've built this based on good fundamental operations, and we believe that that is gonna to continue to improve and that we can operate in a number of different uh, states where we think we could have a, a, a difference. Uh, leadership, we've got a great team. The team works very well together and is really energized about the opportunity. We have great, uh, we have great momentum on, on multiple fronts, and we're excited about that. We have a very robust acquisition and uh, new store and organic growth pipeline. And we're building, we're building this house of brands that we think uh, are really gonna differentiate us in the markets that we're at. And all of it's driven by, we gotta, we gotta operate very well and deliver against our results, deliver against our plan and continue to grow market share in our markets. You know, and lastly, we uh, we appreciate your time. We are committed to uh, bringing bringing the very best of operations to the opportunity to bring cannabis to uh, Main Street America, and uh, we're very focused on building a great a great company and staying close to our customers' needs. And thank you, Justin and Nancy. Great presentation. I am Joe Gomes, the Noble Capital Senior Analyst who covers Schwaz. Here are the questions I've selected from the audience as well as a few of my own. So Justin, let, let's start with kind of the, the Colorado market. You know, what is unique about Colorado that makes it such an attractive market um, for cannabis and how does that benefit Schwaz? Yeah, thank you, Joe. We, uh, we, love, we love Colorado. It's, uh, it's sophisticated. It has uh, it has a very clear book of regulations on how how you compete there, and we have a, a set of very sophisticated operators who've made it through the early boom and bust cycle. So you have good operators that uh, have had to do it with their own capital, and th that basically was precluded from taking outside capital and having you know, large operators, publicly traded operators to come in. And we're certainly uh, taking, you know, taking that as an opportunity to, to build a great company. The other, the other thing about Colorado is, granted it's not a limited license state, but when you look at the jurisdictions, you have limited licenses. It's difficult in a lot of places to have a store and to have a presence. And uh, so when you really kind of peel back the opportunity, uh, you need to look at it on a geography or a geographic basis by MSA, by town, by county, and it's a very local business, which we think, uh, you know, with our relationships and our, our ability to, to acquire and create value, we think that bodes well for us and it's very fragmented. Great, and you, and you mentioned about your cultivation uh, efforts Kind of what are your goals for the company in terms of cultivation? How much of your own product would you like to supply? How much are you you uh, getting uh, comfortable getting from outside sources? And how many um, other people do you does the company currently purchase from? 
Yeah, it's a, that great, great question. We're we're probably different than some other vertically integrated operators. I mean, there's no secret. We're going to continue to add to our own cultivation requirements for our internal needs, and you'll see uh, you'll continue to see us be focused on that. It, when you, we think about capital allocation, I think we we think about having certainly 40 to 50 percent of our own needs, uh, cultivation needs in house for our retail and our biomass, but we'll continue to to partner and buy from very good growers. Today, it's well over 30 growers that we buy biomass from, trim, as well as flour. And our goal is to give the customer what they want uh, at a value that, that makes sense. So instead of us dedicating all this capital uh, to cultivation, we want to kind of take a belt and suspenders method where we source from the outside as well as have our inside uh, capabilities. Thanks for that. As I'm sure you're well aware, there's always lots of questions on the M&A strategy. So I'm going to kind of combine two of them, two of them here. Um, first one being, can you give us a sense of what the profile of the acquisition targets will be from a business strategy, geographic, economics, valuation, valuation metrics, and timing, and combine that with another question that says, you know, does Schwaz have preference rights to the other Starbuds locations in other states? And if so, um, or if Schwaz decides to expand to other states? Uh, great, great question. So we look for really good businesses. So we want to start with uh, uh, operators and owners that have great integrity, that uh, have done it the right way, that there's not a lot of surprises uh, from a liability standpoint or tax perspective, we go fairly deep in due diligence. And uh, so we start with that. These businesses are profitable. These businesses are differentiated and have some capability that we uh, were attracted to. And obviously the ability for us to create value and drive synergy. So if we're buying a business for, you know, say a multiple of EBITDA, we hope to be able to generate enough sales and EBITDA uh, to obviously lower that multiple as we go forward. But you're going to see us, you'll see us really look to prioritize retail and, and some brands as we, uh, as we go forward. We're going to be very focused on building out our retail network in Colorado. Uh, we think there's an opportunity to have north of 100 stores um, in the state and servicing the different parts of the state with really good products and great service. So, um, those will those will be the priorities, but we will certainly for the right brand opportunity and for the right cultivation capability, we'll we'll do fill-ins there. You know, our goal is to build a five six hundred million dollar business in the state of Colorado. And the Starbucks so, question, long-term goal. Uh, we do not have we uh, on the Starbucks side. Certainly, they're the two founders uh, are large shareholders of Schwaz, and uh, we have a very good relationship with them. And they certainly have they have other assets where they're they're minority investors in some of those stores. And, um, you know, we'll take each one of those one at a time and see if it makes sense for us down the road. OK, it, it just in the, the Colorado expansion for a moment, um, if we go back to that, you, you highlighted the geographic areas um, from looking at that map, um, you know, are, are you comfortable? you know, buying ones and twosies, is it more you want to find another Starbucks type of acquisition? What kind of is the sweet spot um, for you in terms of the acquisition strategy just in Colorado right now? Well, it really, it really doesn't start with how many stores people have. Certainly, certainly larger is better, but we really are looking at what, what sort of market uh, opportunity is there by jurisdiction. So that's what sort of leads that process, whether it's a one store, two store uh, opportunity. We certainly look at stores where we can add value and drive, you know, where we can bring our playbook in and make a difference with product assortment, how we buy, uh, labor scheduling, all the sort of the, the things that it takes to run a business every day, run a really good consistent business. So we look at that. Uh, certainly, we're not afraid of a larger acquisition uh, if it fits our network, uh, and we think there's opportunities to to dense up uh, Denver. So we're we're continuing to look in Denver. It's not one and done. It's 
This is a, uh, a neighborhood business, so we're going to continue to look and be aggressive there. Thank you for that. Let me. I'm going to, I'm going to throw one more uh, M and A type of question at you since they keep popping up here, and then we'll we'll move on. But the question says, "What is the time frame for achieving the 500 to 600 million business with 100 plus stores? And how do you plan on structuring those deals so you manage dilution?" Great, great question. I, well, it's going to take us. It's, it'll take us a, several years to get to that, but I think we can certainly get to that level. Uh, we're going to do it the right way. There's no shortcuts, so you got to write, you got to buy good companies, do due diligence on them, and uh, you know I think we've proven our ability to underwrite capital markets post COVID have improved substantially, which was really our holdup uh, last year. We had the deals made and the deals that we wanted to do, and you know from a from a capital raising perspective, it was far more difficult for the entire industry, and now it's getting much much easier. So with regards to how we structure deals, I mean, today uh, we announced that, you know, we have about $23 million of cash on the balance sheet. We have plenty of liquidity. We're generating free cash flow. And for, you know, smaller acquisitions, we have the cash to do that. And I think you'll continue to see us structure it where we'll use seller, seller paper, so a seller note with some equity and with some cash. So we will we'll be thoughtful about how we do that. We certainly uh, are careful about dilution. Uh, we want to make sure that we're taking good care of our shareholders and you know buying businesses at a good value where we can create additional value by bringing them into our platform and really have it be a win-win transaction for the seller and and participate in the upside of what we're building here as well as for our shareholders. So. I think you'll see stock, you'll see some seller paper, and then you'll also see some cash. And, you know, we'll use we'll use cash when when we need to, and we'll use stock when our stock is fairly, fairly valued. We think we're we think we're tremendously undervalued today. Right. Um, so kind of switching gears here, a uh, question that's submitted, what percent of the 250 million forecasted revenue run rate? will be organic versus inorganic. And I'll combine that with, you know, what could possibly trip up the company from achieving its sales guidance? Uh, let me take the first, I mean, so it'll be, a, it'll be a combination. So we are looking at new stores, new licenses, as well as buying mom and, you know, buying single store operators and smaller entities a majority of that would be through acquisition joe um so if you're looking you know we're growing at roughly 38 percent on the retail side i think we'll see that uh i think we'll see as we start to cycle uh COVID and so forth i think we'll have uh you know a little more modest numbers going forward but uh, I think we'll have very healthy healthy numbers organically from our existing stores as well as uh, new stores that we try to develop. Um, but majority, to answer your question, is going to come from acquisitions. And then, what was the second part? What could trip up the company from achieving its revenue goals? Yeah, I mean, there's we're, we've been we've been um, we're a uh, essential business, so that that's uh, that's heading the right way. I think from a regulatory standpoint, uh, we've got very good momentum. I don't see I don't see any federal uh, influence coming in and stopping uh, what we're developing. I think we're we feel pretty good about you know vacationers and tourists coming back to Colorado. We think that'll be a shot in the arm that we've not had in the last really the last year, year and a half. So, you know, there certainly there would be there will be risks uh, around that. We have adequate today. We have adequate supply of flour and product. Uh, we're seeing new, you know, new cultivation come online with more plant count. So from our perspective, we feel we feel really good about where we're headed. I think I think our estimates have been conservative. Uh, we want to put numbers out and beat those numbers. So um, I don't see, you know, I really don't see much um much downside with where we're at okay and let's talk a little bit about third-party delivery um can you elaborate a little on the launch plans and expectations um you know how do you see that 
uh, service being uh, uh, rolled out? And, you know, do you think that gives you a competitive advantage in the Colorado marketplace? You know, I would say, I would say this, we're, we're very much of the mindset to test and measure number of different ways to take care of the customer uh, at from a delivery perspective or pickup. So you will see us deploy not only our own vehicles, but you'll also see us partner uh, with third parties uh, as we look to do that. I think you will see, see us from a curbside standpoint, uh, we'll continue to work on that to make it very easy for the shopper to come pick up uh, their items at our stores. You'll also see us work you know, we'll have same day delivery. So to the extent that we have orders in the morning, uh, we'll look to get those orders out in the afternoon, much like we've I've done in other businesses. And then I think, you know, we'll have next day delivery as well. Our job is to make sure we're providing products and services that meet the needs of customers. And you know what, they're, they're changing every day and we've got to continue to stay very nimble and adapt to that. So that's why we will deploy different uh, different ways of taking care of the customer. Uh, do I think we will have a competitive advantage? I think uh, I think so. We're going to work really hard, in making sure we uh, we meet the needs and expectations of the customer. So we don't miss windows. We uh, we give them in stock products, so we don't have a bunch of substitutions like you find in other industries. And we're going to build this thing based on fundamentals and forecasting. And uh, we've got a team ready to do that. And we're going to work really hard. Will we be perfect? We won't be perfect, but we're gonna get it out there and provide a good service. We'll iterate, we'll get voice of the customer and we'll continue to make it better. And I think that'll, I think we'll do just fine. Here's another one from the audience. Uh, you mentioned that the capital environment and cost are starting to improve. Can you elaborate on that and how much of an impact that will have on 2021 cash flows? Yeah, so great question. So we're seeing, you know, we're seeing the rates uh, come down on debt financing quite a bit. So, you know, anywhere from 500 basis points improvement. So if you're seeing debt out there at 15% or 16%, you're seeing it sort of be in 10, 11% today uh, for different opportunities. Uh, and, I, and I think you're getting a lot more folks coming into investing. So there is more capital that is competing for these opportunities. And uh, so that's that all bodes well. From a cash flow perspective, we certainly will continue, uh, I don't wanna put words in Nancy's mouth, but we're gonna continue to look at flexibility and liquidity. We're gonna prioritize the ability for us to have cash and have plenty of liquidity to do the things that we wanna to do to take advantage of the great opportunity ahead of us. And we'll probably, you know, we're certainly wanna pay as little as we can uh, for the opportunity of that capital, but we'll prioritize liquidity and, uh, you know, our cash to be able to do that. So what does that mean? Uh, means by towards the end of the year, we'll we'll look at some some different opportunities on the debt side. Okay, thanks for that. And let's kind of wrap up here with uh, the biosciences initiative. Um, I thought that was pretty interesting when I saw that announcement. Maybe you could elaborate a little bit more on that initiative and, and what you're looking to do with uh, them. Yeah, here's what I, here's what I can tell you. Uh, we believe in innovation. This industry is changing quickly. Uh, there, is, uh, there is a litany of cannabinoids that have not been studied that we don't understand. Uh, to the tune of hundreds. And uh, we are, we're doing a very common sense approach to this with uh, making some investment into this business, but we really want to pace this where we've got rapid application to products so we can go and monetize uh, our research and our learnings quickly. So this isn't 10 years before we have anything come to market. So we're gonna do a lot of work on the different cannabinoids and their effects and their efficacy. And we'll find, we'll be able to dial, you know, specific products around different genetic types to treat certain certain conditions, et cetera. So we're very excited about that. We think we've, we think we've got a very good team to go do that. And we, we see some products coming out fairly quickly. Uh, on the heels of this. So we're taking a very common sense approach to what we're investing. And we uh, we hope to create, you know, new products and, and create some value out of this quickly. 
Great. We got uh, one late comment question, so I'll, I, I will ask this one here. Um, outside of the, what we're doing today, uh, when and how and what will it take to get the street and institutional investors slash analysts to discover Schwaz? Do you feel that becoming an MSO instead of an SSO would facilitate that? I'm going to let Nancy take that hot question. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, well, you know, certainly becoming an MSO, I think, adds uh, people to the picture, but we're not running in that direction um, just because of that. So we're very focused again in Colorado. We really believe there's a solid business with good return here, but we are going to uh, make a concerted effort to get our story out. I mean, in reality, we just became this business as of the end of March. And so we're just starting to get the story out. It's going to take a little bit of time. And I, we believe that just, you know, our current story, but we have a long-term approach that we believe is the right approach in terms of going deep in Colorado as well as other states. Great. Joe, this is our, this is our big reveal. We are <laughs> we're a fundamentally new company. Uh, as of March, and you know we're generating really good free cash flow. We've get, we're very profitable. We're going to continue to be so, and we're going to build this thing to win for the long term. And uh, we'll be as patient as we need to to go uh, to go build this. And we're excited. And uh, but certainly we are an unknown story. It, it breaks my heart when I tell people about Schwaz and they go, "I've never heard of you." So we uh, we have been very focused on making sure we have a good business and putting process and technology and get deals done. And now we're happy to share our story. Thank you for joining us for this virtual roadshow presentation brought to you by Channel Check. View our YouTube channel for more video content, including C-suite interviews, virtual roadshows, and conference presentation replays. New content is added regularly, so subscribe below to stay up to date. Visit channelcheck.com or click the link in the description to access equity research, news, and advanced market data on this and 6,000 other small and microcap companies.